just imagine you know everything about CA125, how it has been discovered and how you can interpret this very common test in gynecology. Today with my colleague Wasal, we are going to walk you through this journey step by step from discovery till how we use it in cancer interpretation. This is the first series of uh, these videos and I hope you will enjoy it. If you will, please leave your comments and we will get back to you. Wesal, thanks for preparing this presentation. Can you tell us, first of all, why CA125? When did you start developing your interest about CA125? Okay, so um, my interest from CA125 has just come from my clinical practice. It's a marker that we use uh, a lot in gynecology, but also um, my colleagues in GP practice and also in general surgery use it quite frequently in the context of uh, ovarian cancer. So um, the thing is that me and as well as my other fellow trainees, I found that a lot of us don't really know much about this marker and essentially its origins, where it's come from and how to interpret the uh, results for the marker. Means it is extremely important that we understand how CA125 get produced in our body. One of yes. the differential diagnoses is cancer. But what we are going to discuss today to tell you why in many occasions, cancerous and non-cancerous, you can have raised CA125. Especially if a woman is in a reproductive age, raised CA125 is not an indication of ovarian cancer. It can be an indication of ovarian cancer, but it should not be on the top of your list. There are so many, so many other reasons that can cause raised CA125 that we are going to discuss it briefly at the end of this short video. Westall, can you tell us how they discover CA125. It's quite interesting. Okay, so I will start off with a brief introduction into what is CA125. So essentially CA125 is a protein. Um, it's an epitope on a much larger protein called uh, MUX16. And MUX16 is a mucin which is expressed um, by sort of normal epithelial cells, uh, which are derivative of the celiac epithelium. So what we would find is that in normal physiological conditions, this um, CA125 or MUX16 is expressed in the pleura, in the pericardium, and also in uh, the peritoneum, as well as in sort of normal epithelia of the endometrium, uh, fallopian tubes, and the endocervix. So essentially, by theory, any condition that affects those surfaces or those epithelia would uh, result in a raised CA125. Now, in the context of ovarian cancer, uh, CA125 um, is overexpressed. And this uh, protein actually has been found to aid the local sort of tumor invasion and also metastasis uh, by various mechanisms. So one of the uh, mechanisms by which uh, it aids a uh, sort of local invasion is that it affects uh, so immune cells called natural killer cells. Um, and essentially by sort of downregulating the response, it means that these cells are less likely to identify uh, cancerous cells and kill them. So essentially uh, in context of cancer, this uh, response so cleverly allows the local invasion and progression of um, these cells. This is quite interesting that maybe we should know that CA125 just is a normal, is, is produced in a normal physiological condition in order to protect epithelial surface. Because of that, you can find it 
in pericardium, you can find it in a pleural space, and also you can find it in peritoneal cavity. This is important to know. Ovarian cancer is quite clever in terms of they overexpress CA125 because CA125 then go and kill natural killer cells that by nature, they can prevent metastasis of the cancer. But by overexpression of CA125, ovarian cancer can overcome this natural immunity of the body and it can help ovarian cancer to metastatize. Also, because CA125 is not limited to ovaries or abdominal cavity, any other condition can affect any serosal space that naturally produce CA125 can raise the CA125 by default. Okay, it was a very comprehensive discussion about what is CA125. We found out is part of the glycoprotein, okay, which is naturally present on uh, epithelial surfaces. Can you tell us how they discovered CA125? So CA125 was uh, discovered uh, back in 1981 by uh, Dr. Robert Bast and his colleagues. So Dr. Robert Bast had um, an interest in developing targeted immunotherapy for ovarian cancer. And the way how he wanted to go about doing that is by developing an antibody which specifically targets ovarian cancer cells. So um, what Dr. Robert uh, Bast and um, his colleagues did is they use this uh, newly developed uh, in the 1970s hybridoma technology. So what this uh, hybridoma technology is, is a way of mass producing uh, monoclonal antibodies um, specific to a certain antigen. So what uh, they did was they isolated a cell line, uh, which they named OVCA433 from a patient with a uh, papillary um, serous cystadenoma. And they injected this cell line into a mouse, which then went on to uh, develop a, an immune response against this ovarian cancer cell line. So what they did is they then extracted uh, uh, B lymphocytes uh, from uh, the spleen of these uh, mice containing um, the B lymphocytes producing the specific antibody for the ovarian cancer cell line. And they fused it with a, a tumor cell uh, as shown in this diagram. And this tumor cell is a myeloma cell. Now, the uh, good thing about B lymphocytes is of course they can produce specific antibodies. However, they don't have the longevity and they don't have the capabilities of mass producing antibodies which will be required in order to uh, so perform any laboratory tests um, in a laboratory environment. So by fusing a, a myeloma cell which has the uh, uh, essentially the advantages of longevity and also of mass production of antibodies, they're able to form a hybridoma, which is a fused cell. It's a fused B lymphocyte and a fused uh, and a, a myeloma cell. And through that, they were able to mass produce uh, the antibody, which they later called OC125. So OC125 was an antibody which was specific to the uh, ovarian uh, cancer cell lines tested. And the reason why it's called OC125 is that it took 125 attempts before finding a specific antibody for ovarian cancer. For ovarian cancer. This is quite interesting that because uh, Dr. Bost and his colleague, they were quite interested in immunotherapy. And it was quite incidental, not incidental finding, but this was not the main reason for the whole research. They were looking for antibody in order to prevent ovarian cancer spread. But as we know that ovarian cancer 125 does not have any clinical values. And we use that in order to measure ovarian cancer, in order to measure cancer antigen 125. 
I think we should thank to hybridoma, you know, technology in order to fuse B lymphocytes with myeloma in order to mass produce antibody and to try 125 times to finally find specific monoclonal antibody against ovarian cancer cell. I hope you already enjoyed just five or 10 more minutes. We are going to discuss briefly about how we are going to measure CA125 in our patient and also which cutoff score we use. Can you tell us about how we are going to measure CA125 in the blood? Okay, so um, Dr. Robert Bast and his colleagues um, sort of developed this uh, radioimmune assay where they, if you can imagine that this tray is a polystyrene bead, they used it, um, they coated the polystyrene uh, tray or beads with the OC125 uh, antibody. And they used it as a catcher antibody so that when they add the patient's blood uh, or the patient's uh, serum to the sample, they're able to capture the antigen CA125, which is uh, represented by the blue dot here. Now to the same uh, sample, they also uh, added a radio labeled um, OC125 antibody, which then is able to bind to the captured antigen. And they incubated this for about uh, up to 24 hours, after which they wash away all the excess uh, radio-labeled uh, antigens, uh, antibodies, I should say. And uh, through that, they used uh, something called a gamma counter to quantify the uh, so radio-labeled antibody antigen complexes. And through that, they're able to uh, sort of give a numerical value of how much CA125 is in the patient's blood. Thanks very much. I think it's quite complex uh, context to understand. Uh, I just try to repeat. Just imagine you use this gray area as a polystyrene bead. Remember that red and green, both of them are antibodies. This polystyrene with the green already exists in the lab, and you add patient blood, which has got CA125, which we represent here with the blue dots. And after that, we add radio immunoassay antibodies. And we want to create this complex, which has got two antibodies and one antigen and one of the antibodies is being labeled. After we wash out, of course, the CA125 who has been captured are not going to be washed out. And the more of this complex you have, means the more CA125 or cancer antigen you have in your blood and the values are going higher. We try to explain it in a very simple way, but please, if you still have some questions, leave your comments and me and my colleague try to get back to you uh, with more clear answer. After that, we are going to discuss about what's the normal cutoff score and which numbers we should be worried. And at the end, I'm going to talk about differential diagnosis and we will finish our topic for today. So is elevated CA125 always a cause of concern? So that's the main uh, question. So let's talk a bit about the sort of cutoff score. So where did this 35 units per litre value come from? So in the initial studies, what they uh, found is that when they measured the levels of CA125 in 888 healthy women, levels above 1% were only found, uh, so levels above 35 units per litre only found in 1% of uh, these women. And so levels above that were found in sort of women with ovarian cancer. The other interesting uh, fact they found is that the uh, rise and the fall of the CA125 levels were associated with the disease progression and uh, regression. Which is quite important because when they put 188 samples from presumably healthy women 
the majority of them, 99%, the levels were less than 35. And because of that, they concluded we can use the level of 35 as a cutoff score. And we get worried if CA125 comes above CA35. But what I would like to discuss now, there are so many causes of raised CA125. Whenever you think about CA125, you have to think about, first of all, non cancerous cause of raised CA125 and then cancerous cause. Whatever or any condition can stimulate any pericardium, pleural or peritoneal membrane, they can raise CA125. Why pregnancy? Because of the pregnant uterus, it can stretch the peritoneum and CA125 can go up. Menstruation, because of backflow menstrual blood, it can irritate peritoneum and it can cause raised CA125. PID, the same, ovarian hyperstimulation, endometriosis, all of them can stimulate peritoneum and as a result, CA125 can go up. We are going to discuss in next video in more detail why when you stimulate peritoneum, CA125 can go up. But I think for the sake of this video, we just need to know there are so many reasons behind raised CA125. And when someone comes with raised CA125, we don't need to think about cancer straight away, especially if that patient is in reproductive age. Also, not only ovarian cancer can cause raised CA125, cervical cancer, uterine cancer, breast cancer, lung cancer, anything can irritate mesothelium, can raise CA125. I hope you enjoy this short, but quite informative video. I thank my colleague, our trainee, Dr. Wessel, for very good presentation. And please, if you like, subscribe and follow us as we are going to come up with more videos regarding CA125 to get much better understanding of how this molecule works. Thank you. Thank you very much for listening.